Okay, if I could ask everybody to find their seats again. We'll try to take some of this energy and put it to good use. Uh, welcome back after the break. Uh, my name is George Matsumoto, and I've, I've been a, uh, I would say, volunteered to be the moderator for this session. This is what happens when you miss a conference call. Um, but it has been a pleasure to be working with the committee on this particular workshop. It's an exciting workshop. It's been a great morning so far. I'm really looking forward to uh, this panel and for the rest of the workshop. Uh, we're very pleased. Uh, oh, housekeeping rules. Uh, our housekeeping thoughts. Uh, some of the things I wanted to mention was that during this panel session and for the rest of the workshop, when you do ask a question at the microphone, we would really appreciate it if you would give your name and affiliation at the same time. Uh, I also want to remind everybody here and online that the opinions expressed in this room are usually personal opinions and not the opinions of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, and uh, for lunch, just in case I forget to tell you, uh, for the speakers and for the members of the roundtable, there is a lunch provided. Uh, for those who are not speakers or members of the roundtable, there's a lovely cafeteria downstairs, and of course, it's a beautiful day outside. A little warm for me, but it's a beautiful day. Uh, and with that, um, I'd also like to introduce uh, some additional members for this morning's panel. You, we've already heard from both Carrie and Tim, but we have three more uh, panel members here, and I'd like to uh, introduce all three of them and then ask each one of the three to speak for a little bit. Uh, we have uh, Kirk uh, Engelhart, uh, who's the first director of research communications for the Georgia Tech Research Institute. Uh, he, has, he leads a campus-wide collaborative communication uh, he's focused in on the campus-wide collaborative communication culture, uh, overseeing over $700 million in research funding. Um, we have, see, I just put down first names. Jim Gruning uh, from uh, the University of Maryland. He's a professor emeritus from the Department of Communications. He has over 20 years experience in public relations. He's developed uh, new theories for public relations, and those of you in the field are probably aware of some of these, including the four models of public relations. And then we also have Marsha Keene, who's the Chair of Strategic Initiatives at the Feinstein Keene uh, Health Healthcare, um, helping companies shape their visibility and credibility. And uh, I'm very pleased that all three of these uh, speakers are up here, uh, joining both Carrie and Tim. And we're going to start off with uh, Marsha. And the things we've asked the panelists to speak on a little bit are sort of what can we learn from your community of practice? Uh, what does uh, trust really mean for your community. We've heard a little bit about the definition of trust and some of the vocabulary focused in on trust from this morning's speakers. Uh, we'd really like to hear any particular stories about what has worked or what hasn't worked with trust, some successes or failures, uh, and really what is trust and does it differ or is it the same in your field as it is with life sciences? Uh, and then after each one of the three speak, I'll as also ask Carrie and Tim if they have any other words before we start our interactions. So, Marsha. Thanks very much, George, and uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, I'm going to, as George said, talk a little bit about um, the 30 plus years I've spent in the biotech industry, primarily focused on biotech for healthcare purposes. And, um, for purposes of today's discussion, I'd like to talk about what I've called a 20th century model for biotech and life sciences. As it pertains to trust, I call it a trust fabric built on authority. And what I believe is that over the, the 30 year period, 30 plus years, science progressed and was accepted by the public through a very top-down, unidirectional, if you will, process that went largely from elites to laymen. And that is experts from very prestigious institutions, to a large degree Ivy League colleges, um, did their science, their results were validated by being published in peer-reviewed journals. Is that better? Okay. Normally, people are telling me to speak more softly, so <laughs> this is a nice change. I hope you call the people in my office. <laughs> um, tell them. Okay, so um, the way the process unfolded was that the experts from very prestigious institutions would do the science, conduct the science, get results. The results were validated by being published in peer-reviewed publications, journals. Those journals would then be reported on by top-tier journalists. 
and then they would be, the uh, news of this would be framed by, uh, by what I call a professional class in the biotech ecosystem. And, and what was that all about? Well, basically in biotech cradles such as Cambridge or San Francisco, um, there was a whole class of people, lawyers, accountants, professional science communicators, who worked together to make sure that the information that got out was accurate, that it was framed in ways that the top tier media could pay attention to, could understand. And so there was a very specific, if you will, chain. It was linear, it was pretty predictable for over 30 years, and uh, because I like alliteration, as I call it, the elite ecosystem. Um, it worked very well. Uh, biotech for, the, for healthcare has been almost totally accepted. I think the role, um, I call it an implicit social contract. So we had the science community which conducted science, did their discoveries, published, got interviewed, did financing over and over and over, and then succeeded, failed to commercialize, and then repeated it over and over, serial, serial scientists, serial entrepreneurs. The public, I think, in this model was fairly passive. Uh, they provided funding through tax dollars to the NIH, uh, through charitable contributions to advocacy organizations, you know, give to the American Cancer Society and they'll fund research, et cetera, et cetera, um, or through investments in companies as they went public. But basically, they relied on institutions to regulate as those institutions saw fit. They trusted those institutions to do it. They read about the findings in the media, and then they sat back and essentially have benefited from the products. Particularly if the biotech industry found a product that would cure the particular disease I had. And although there were activists along the way crying foul, basically their voices were drowned out by this very methodical process in this very uh, implicit social contract. So now though, sadly, we're in the 21st century, happily or sadly, <laughs> and our sciences now are not pure biotech headed for healthcare. We now have converged sciences. Biology plus engineering plus digital is all getting smushed together. And I'm hoping that we're gonna build a trust fabric. Again, it's a fabric, I don't think it's a thing. Um, it's not a single word. It's a fabric that gets woven over time or pulled apart over time. That fabric may get built, but I think it will be in a totally different way. And here I'm going to do alliteration around the letter P. And I, I'm going to say it's going to be built, if it's built at all, through par partnership, participation, and peer groups. That is, is multi-directional and it's non-linear. So what happens to the public in this? They're no longer passive. They're proactive and they're interactive. And everything's around precision and personalization, for, at first due to the genomics, an N of one. And then funding is no longer passive. Things can be crowdfunded. And through the Jobs Act, for example, a company like Polywog that's created a whole platform for individual investment into life science innovative companies. They can track their own data, the quantified self, the watch is constantly, constantly seeing all about me and my data. And then they can share their data and partake of aggregated data. The obvious is patients like me, but the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute called PCORID has, is now creating patient powered research networks in which patients with a particular disease get together, there's a funding from PCORI, and they put their health data into a portal for the express purpose of it being used for research. They can also conduct citizen science in places like GenSpace around synthetic biology. They can participate in studies more proactively. There's the new Apple Research Kit. And they can be in the social media all the time having an opinion. So it's all about the public at the center now, living the science. And I'm not sure the scientific community has fully come to grips with this, but I think there has to be a new social contract from the science side as well, because the old model, I don't believe, is going to keep working. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Marcia.
<clears throat> and we'll take questions of all the panel members after we finish. Jim? I guess that happens when you're an emeritus professor, you press the mute instead of the speak. <laughs> um, I come to this panel with somewhere around 50 years of research. I guess we're all playing one-upsmanship here, but research on public relations and science communication, beginning as an agricultural journalist many years ago at Iowa State University and then uh, nearly uh, over 30, nearly 35 years at the University of Maryland. Uh, I gradually moved from interest in science writing and science communication to a broader interest in or uh, public relations. Now, public relations is often thought of as simply media publicity or, or seeking of publicity, but I define it much more broadly. Uh, there are two key terms in the term public relations, publics and relations or publics and relationships. So those are the two themes I would like to, to mention briefly and at least give some hints of the research related to those. In the last uh, 10 to 15 years, there has been a great deal of interest in organization public relationships in the field of public relations. We've borrowed from literature in the interpersonal communication and applied it to the relationships between organizations and publics. And there are different dimensions of relationships that have been emphasized, but there are four of them that, that I generally use, or that I've developed measurement scales for, and that my students and others have used extensively. The first of these is trust, which fits neatly with the, the theme of this conference. I saw some definitions this morning, and they're very close to what I would use, uh, emphasizing risk and so on. But essentially, trust is the willingness to open oneself to risk by engaging in a relationship with another party. It essentially has three dimensions. Integrity, the belief that an organization is fair and just. Dependability, the belief that an organization will do what it says it will do. And competence, the belief that an organization has the ability to do what it will do. But I think the openness to risk is the important element here. In Years ago, interpersonal communication scholars used to have games, that trust games that they played. One was called a head trust game, so that one person would lie down on his back and the other person would hold his head, and then you would relax long enough so that you'd be confident that he wouldn't pull his hands away and smash his head on the floor. And the other was the trust game of falling backwards. One partner would fall backwards and the other would catch him, so you had to trust the other partner to catch you. I often wanted to play this game at faculty retreats because I, I had a dean who I wanted to see the look on his face when I didn't catch him. Uh, but you may have all had that experience. Uh, the second dimension, and let me point out that the other three dimensions are highly correlated with, with trust. One that's my favorite is the concept of control mutuality or mutuality of control. That is, each party to a relationship believes he or she or it has the rightful power to influence the other one, that I have some degree of influence over decisions that are made that put me at risk. Um, and one example that's come out many times is nuclear power, that people believe they have no control over the externalities, if you will, of nuclear power. And interestingly, just this week, uh, Danielle Allen wrote in the Washington Post about the riots in Baltimore made an interesting distinction between the libertarian concept of freedom from something versus a more progressive view of freedom to participate in the system. And I think this captures the, the notion of control mutuality, that, that people in the Baltimore riots felt they had no degree of control over the system of which they were a part. The other two are satisfaction, that you're satisfied with the relationship, and the other is commitment that the relationship is worth continuing. Now, we can measure these dimensions of, of relationships and it use them to evaluate relationships between organizations and publics, and we've done them many times. The question because, becomes, how does one have a, quote, relationship with science, quote, unquote, or how does one trust science, quote, unquote? 
I think actually the relationships with science or scientific, are with scientific organizations, between scientific organizations or even individual scientists and publics, such as relationships with government, or corporations, scientific organizations, one's own doctor, insurance companies, and on and on, so that all of these are important. Well, the next area of research is on the nature of publics, because we often talk about the public, but going back to John Dewey in the 1920s, who wrote a book called The Public and Its Problems, I've always defined publics as small groups of people who experience similar problems and organize to do something about those problems. Our research has uh, identified three major types of publics. Uh, active publics, which are those that actively go out and seek information and actively enter into a relationship. I think Marcia just described those active publics. Another kind that I think are probably being measured most often in, in polling of the general population are low involvement passive publics who really are not affected by or see any connection to a particular scientific problem or scientific externality, but because of curiosity, they pay attention to talk shows and media coverage and that sort of thing. In general, these kind of publics go away very quickly and are not terribly important. And then thirdly, there are what I've called hot issue publics that come about when there's intense media attention to and what has been called issues within an issue arena. And I've read some recent research. One example, obviously, is vaccines and the attention to measles vaccines just a few months ago. Uh, studies of swine flu vaccinations in Finland, tainted U.S. beef in Asia, etc. Typically, hot issue publics uh, begin to recognize problems, begin to think about issues when the media pays a great deal of attention to them. Uh, but as soon as the media lets go of the issue, the publics go away. Uh, but our research shows that they typically remain more sensitized to that issue so that at a time when the problem might begin to affect them personally, then they become more active publics. Now, just a few other thoughts before I, I give a, uh, stop speaking. Um, trust in government in corporations, which is what we're often talking about now with organization public relationships, has been shown to be affected, influenced heavily by political, uh, political ideology. And I heard this mentioned, I think, in both presentations today. So the trust becomes a political issue rather than a scientific issue. Uh, Joe Achenbach is an article that was appeared in the, the Washington Post a few months ago and I think was in National Geographic magazine pointed this out. Another concept that I would quickly mention is that it's been found that trust and distrust are two different things, that they're separate dimensions of, of one, uh, they're not the same concept. Distrust is not the absence of trust and vice versa. And research shows actually that distrust is much more salient, salient to people than is trust. Uh, distrust consists of a couple of dimensions. One is discredibility, that the organization is believed not to be account accountable, to be unethical, to not respect laws, and so on. And the second is malevolence, that uh, organizations will lie to increase profits, that it intentionally deceives the public and it takes more than it gives. Well, the last thing that uh, I think the thrust of this is what can we do to create trust, restore trust, or I would say cultivate relationships between scientific organizations and publics. I think um, a recent article that I've read, read by some Finnish researchers uh, have begun to talk about what they call an issue arena as opposed to just organizational public relationships. That, Issues go into arenas such as, again, vaccinations and, and uh, oil spills and many other things. And what we found is that in general, particularly if you look at social media such as Twitter and Facebook and so on, in general organizations fail to engage with publics in these discussions and issues arenas, especially in the digital media what has been called contingent interactivity. That is, if a member of the public writes something, does someone from the organization respond to it, engage in a true dialogue? 
And in general, the, the more radical groups tend to enter the issue arenas first. They dominate the discussion, and then it's very difficult for the organization to enter into it. So to quote the Finnish scholars, quote, monitoring is necessary for public organizations to become an actor on the stage. Slow reactions give them a place in the audience. And I like that very well. Um, and then finally, research has shown that logic is not always the best way and is usually is not the only way to address a scientific issue, that emotions are important and organizations need to react to the emotions of people and, and deal with their emotions about a scientific issue and not just try to present the facts or correct the facts as they may be distorted in the media or elsewhere. Great. Thank you very much, Jim. And then Kirk. Okay, thank you. Uh, since we were doing the one-upsmanship, I have done no research. I am, uh, <laughs> I do have over 20 years experience as a communicator. So I've been a practitioner for a while in a lot of different, um, different areas. Um, are any of you university research communicators or have any of you done that in the past? Okay, so there's only a couple who will know if what I'm saying is true or not, right? <laughs> so um, what I'd like to do is just do something a little different. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the pressures that are under that university communicators are under that might drive some of the actions that could influence trust um, and kind of give you a little bit of a peek behind the curtains so um, you know, the job of a university communicator has changed a whole lot in the past 10 years I mean it's even changed a lot in the past one year um, you know I remember a day when we were able to just push out news releases and you know we would score some great press and we'd get you know millions of people looking at a story and we pat ourselves on the back and go, gosh, look at the impact we're having. Um, not realizing, of course, back then that we were just measuring activity. You know, it was eyeballs, but what does that really amount to? Um, you know, it really wasn't impact, it was activity. Uh, and, you know, when we talk about, you know, outcomes, you know, I mean, you get a story out there and what happens in the days, the weeks, and the months after the story runs? The fact that you've got eyeballs on a story is, in some cases, meaningless. What happens as a result of the press you get or the exposure you get is where the impact happens. Um, measuring impact, especially impact for communication, is really hard. There's no you know, outcomes analytics dashboard that you can just pull up and go, oh, I had an impact of five today for communication. Um, you, know, you, you really have to dig deep, dig very deep. Uh, to know uh, if your communication activities are having any impact at all. You know, in a university, when we put research stories out, we're interested, you know, did they lead to any new opportunities or collaborations for the researchers? Um, did they generate any new research grants? I mean, we've been able to track, a release goes out here, $40 million comes in here. Um, that's an impact, that's real. Um, did we boost our overall reputation yeah, as a result of putting out news? Uh, that's really important. You have to be able to do benchmark research in the beginning to know where you stand before you start. You have to do your activity and you have to measure again and see if you move the needle. Um, all of this takes a whole lot of time, a whole lot of effort, um, but it's worth it. One of the problems is that a lot of organizations want to take the easy way out. Uh, measuring activity is really easy. And if you can convince people that, hey, I got a million eyeballs on this story, you know, that if you can convince them that that's an impact, um, you know, they might believe that <laughs> and not realize that there's a whole lot more that should be happening as a result of the communication that you're putting out there. Um, you know, the, uh, there's, a, there's something that happens where, you know, when you, when you value the wrong things, when you value activity um, over uh, output, over results, um, you tend to get into an area where you, people uh, think that quantity is more important than quality. Um, and that becomes a problem when you're just pumping out news release after news release and you know, trying to rack up those clicks and rack up those eyeballs. Um, you know, it's easy to see how exaggeration, how hype, how some of these other things could feed into the process if you're a communicator and that's what you're being evaluated on. Um, you want to get more eyeballs on, on the stuff that you're putting out there. But yeah, as, as Tim said earlier, there really isn't a connection between hyping a story and getting more eyeballs on your work. 
Um, so the people who are doing that, I question why. Why waste the time? Why take the risk? Why put your reputation and the reputation of your university on the line um, to do that when there's not going to be a benefit at the, in the end anyhow? Um, so adding to all of this is the pressure that higher education is competitive. Just like industry, just like any domain, you know, every, every university is competing for the best students, the best faculty, the biggest grants, those philanthropic dollars, um, and communication can fuel a lot of those things, can get the right attention in the right place. Um, every school wants to be a leader rather than a follower. Um, it often means being first to market, getting your stories out quickly. Um, and guess what happens when you pump stories out quickly, especially stories about research? The faster you do it, the more room for error you have you put into the process. You know, things could be misinterpreted, exaggeration seeps in, you've got misinformation that's spread, and none of it is good for your university, your reputation, for the public, and it certainly doesn't do anything to help the public trust um, in the research. So university communicators you know, have to be, they're dedicated you know, we're dedicated to building a solid reputation for the institutions that we work for. And, you know, by playing fast and loose with some of this, we're putting all of that at risk. Um, and it's not worth it. So at Georgia Tech, you know, I'll tell you a little bit about what we do. We're really serious about research communication. Um, have we made mistakes? Yes. Will we make mistakes again? Yes. Every university will. Um, but we're very lucky to have a highly skilled um, science writing research news team. Um, you know, these are experienced people who've been doing this a very long time. Um, and you know, they go through a whole list of steps before we put a story out. Um, and it includes, you know, looking at the journal articles and talking to the professors to see if there's any meat on the bone first. Um, there are a lot of stories that come our way where, you know, we're, <laughs> we're being sold on this being the greatest breakthrough ever. And this comes from our own people because they're proud of the work they do, and I don't fault them for this. But as communicators, we need to be smart enough to say, you tested that on four people. <laughs> Let's wait until you have more results. Let's wait until, we know, until there is more meat on the bone, more substance there. Sometimes they don't want to hear it. Um, but we have to be smart enough to identify those situations in advance and not push those stories out the door just because we're being asked to or because we have to get another check mark on a list of having another re release out. Um, interviews with the researchers, um, we work closely with our compliance office um, and you know, look at things like conflict of interest, research protocols, regulatory issues, that's really important when it comes to bioengineering and bioscience. We look at the fine print on our research contracts because there's often stipulations on there about what can be released, what can't be. We work with collaborating research organizations. If there are multiple universities on a grant, which often happens, we have to form a team and you know, get quotes from everybody and see who says what and how we time and work all of that and that everybody's being honest about what they're sharing. Um, and in many cases, almost all cases, the research sponsors um, and the professors themselves get to review. Uh, to make sure that everything is accurate before it goes out. Makes it difficult to be first to market with a story when you have to go through these steps, but it's a balancing act. It's really important to do this right. If you get it wrong, the consequences are huge. Um, one of the things that makes us a little bit different, and this is something that I've been pushing in the last three years in the role that I've, I'm in now, is that it's not always about getting the largest audience for your story. It's, you know, you don't have to get millions of eyeballs. It's about getting the right audience. Um, you know, I use the example, we could get a story on the front page of uh, USA Today, um, and it gets in front of a lot of people. Or we could get a small story in IEEE Spectrum, and it gets in front of the right people, and we see impact and results as a result of that. Um, you know, targeting is very, very important. And we do it in an integrated way. We do. Um, uh, earned media, which is what we've been talking about, and owned media. Um, we've been publishing a research magazine for 31 years at Georgia Tech, and I have copies of it here if you want it, recently redesigned, um, and it has a whole new focus on our industry and business audience. We want to do more research with industry. We've got to communicate with them in the way they want to be communicated with. Um, so we have reformatted our research communication operation, websites, e-newsletters, the whole kit and caboodle to be able to accomplish this. Um, you know, we're not alone in thinking about, uh, you know, becoming the media and directly communicating and 
um, you know, owning our own vehicles for communicating. I mean, universities are doing this everywhere. Um, in some ways, it's really liberating because you have a lot more control over what you're sending out, but it comes with an enormous responsibility on the other end. Um, you've got to make sure that you're being authentic, you're being honest, and you're accurate in everything that you put out there. Because um, the information that we're sharing impacts lives, industries, policy, people. Um, and you don't want to be the university that makes that mistake. So thank you, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Um, before we start questions, I, I also want to give Tim and Carrie just a minute or two, just in case, like I always do when I give a talk, as soon as I sit down, I remember what I should have said. I didn't know if you had anything else you want to add before we start taking questions. And if I could ask all the members of the panel to bring the microphone as close to your mouth as possible when you answer questions. Thank you. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I want to make a real brief quick comment that sort of at, builds on some of the, uh, the other statements and touches on, again, the complexity of this trust and, and belief issue. Um, and that is how a lot of the issues, whether you're talking about vaccination, GMO, climate change, can often be forms of self-expression. So what do I mean by that? So there's been really interesting research around um, organic food, for example, GMOs um, and uh, sup take the taking of supplements. And this is the idea that people adopt behaviors or adopt beliefs as a form of self-expression. And that's one of the reasons that these changes, it's so difficult to have, they're, they're so resistant to change. Um, I'm trying to think of an example and not be patronizing, but I'll forge ahead and be patronizing. So I drive my Prius. Uh, to the organic food store, um, you know, anti-vaccination, drive with single sc speed bike, you get the idea, right? And because of that, when they've internalized these, these views, they become extremely resistant to change because the facts no longer speak to just what the facts are, now you're insulting the individual. So that, I think that's a really important dimension to this, this story and one of the reasons it's so difficult to change people's minds on, on a lot of these scientific uh, issues. Uh, and I think it builds on a lot of the things that, that were just said about, um, about trust and how it's not just about pop populations, but about very specific groups. Okay. Carrie? Um, thank you. I, I um, wanted to bring up just one thing that is to underscore how much change we are living through right now. Um, I think Marsha's comments are a great reminder of how much change we have gone through over the past 30 some years, particularly in the healthcare setting, and really a, there's been a sea change in how we think about the role of the patient. Um, we are also in the midst of an information age, which creates a sea change on all of these institutions and all of these processes because we have so much uh, access to information is so rapid. It's changing the public publishing world. It's changing the consumer news world. You know, it's permeating through all of these processes. So if anything, you know, our task today is, of course, more complex, but I think that's important to keep in mind um, as we're thinking about this idea of a fabric of social trust, um, that it's occurring in um, a much more fluid information age, and that's a big piece of what's going on. Um, I, think I'd, I think one other comment I think it speaks to, because one of the questions that often comes up is, uh, you know, science is kind of an abstract other, and what happens when you get more personal experience with particular institutions or particular segments of science? And, uh, you know, speaking broadly, I think I can't make a single prediction because it does depend, right, on the nature of those experiences. So even if science were more personal and our experience of it were more personal, you know, it depends on the nature of those experiences and there have been essentially negative experiences and those have a very long tail, in, uh, meaning a trailing effect um, in terms of our reaction to, um, to elements. I can, I can think kind of speculatively, one has to do with the Tuskegee trials. Whenever I show results that have a strong difference uh, between African Americans and whites and Hispanics on issues related to the healthcare system, you know, we'll interview people who are scholars in that area and they, they go to that right away, saying that that is a piece of um, broad thinking about reaction to uh, medical care and views about medical treatment and medical research. Those kinds of things happen. So sometimes the personal experience can be positive and kind of uh, build more, uh, the sense of more reason to trust and build these relationships, and of course sometimes not so positive. 
Great. Well, thank you very much, and thank you to all the speakers. I, I, I want to thank you for your time. And I'd like to open up the panel for questions. And please remember to give your name and affiliation. Uh, we have two microphones, one in the center and one over on the side of the room. Hi, Erica Shugart from the American Society for Microbiology. Uh, as I reflect through the speakers that uh, we looked this morning, Carrie sort of started us off looking at trust with scientists in the medical profession. But then a lot of the speakers have really been t touching upon those third party intermediaries that do a lot of the communication. And so I wondered if there were any comments about how the PIOs, the journalists, um, and all of those uh, the celebrities, all of those people that are in between the scientists and the public affect this trust. And then since they perhaps care less about some of them, uh, the public trust in science, kind of what are the strategies to think about um, working with them in this area of maintaining or improving trust? Good question. And I'm sure you're going to stay for the whole rest of the workshop because there's, there's going to be some more presentations on that issue as well. But if any of our panelists would like to respond. Yeah, I'll go quick. I mean, I, I think that, that this is a really important point. And one of the great challenges, I, you touched on it really briefly. I, I don't know where you went, but, but they, uh, <laughs> um, the idea that they, these intermediaries may not care about the trust issue. And I think that's a really important point because they ha they'll have incentives that are very different from, from the incentives that we perhaps would want mm -hmm. them to have. Uh, and it even goes to some of the things that Kirk was saying about the incentives that uh, university communication offices now have. They've, they've changed. So I think we need to look at uh, incentive structures. I, I, in our paper, we talk about how each one of those, those players in the hype pipeline are com complicit collaborators. Uh, and it's really true. They, they benefit in the short term from hype, and they may not be concerned uh, about trust. So I mean, it's a grand aspirational uh, request, but maybe we need to think about changing incentives uh, or aligning incentives so, so they work better for us. And that, we should start with the universities. Okay. Marcia? Uh, just to add to that, I think they, uh, those intermediaries played a huge positive role in the past, but in many cases they themselves are now under pressure. It's part of this um, new world that I think needs a new social contract. But newspapers, for example, um, don't sustain science reporters the way they used to. So the people that we used to trust to go to to break the story about um, research in a peer-reviewed journal may or may not still be there, or if they are, they're under increasing pressure in terms of how much space they have in the paper. Uh, so I think we can't rely on that golden circle of intermediaries the way we used to, and, and it's sad. I don't envy the younger people coming up through my firm. Their job is way harder than mine was. <laughs> I would let me speak to this from the standpoint of public relations. Uh, it was interesting to learn that much of the exaggeration comes from press releases. And having done a lot of this myself in my early years, both for Iowa State University, the University of Wisconsin, the National Science Foundation, you know, we were always looking out for the unique story, something that would really gather attention and and then a few weeks later or a few months later, somebody else would come up with another unique story and so on. And that often got the attention of journalists. But I think we're leaving, uh, the field of public relations is much more moving toward digital media, social media, and so on. And much more with interacting with active publics through these media. That is, the big story isn't so, mu so important as interacting with the people who truly need information and people who know that they can find the information they need in the media. Uh, in medical areas, uh, sites such as WebMD and, and the Mayo Clinic site and NIH sites and so on. What we typically see is that the people who run these sites for scientific organizations like to place stories on them the same old model that they've been using for generations, just push stories out there. But they don't engage in true dialogue with people who need information. Um, 
as, as you get into your 70s, as I am, you've, you get the need for much more medical information. And I spend a great deal of my time searching for internet information on the internet. Uh, oftentimes, information on the internet about the internet, too, when the computer won't function right. <laughs> but I, I find people asking the same questions that I ask, but I never find people giving the answers. And I think this is what's coming out, is that in the public relations area, Openness and accessibility and all of that is important, but the, the most important thing is dialogue, and that means truly engaging, not disseminating. Uh, there's much discussion in the measurement literature in public relations about engagement. How do we know whether the public is engaged with us? But very little attention paid to whether the organization engages with the public. And that's what's really important, I think, and I just think of simple things that for a university, for example, just setting up websites where science students in high schools or colleges can come for information, uh, placing information on websites so that when they search for it, they can find it. Instead of sending out all these media releases, put information on websites and make it accessible for people doing searches on whatever it is they're doing mm -hmm. research for. Interesting, thank you. I just want to touch on the press release issue um, because, you know, I think we all saw the study that talked about you know, hype starting with press releases. Um, and university communicators have essentially taken it on the chin as a result of that study. And in many cases, it was deserved. Um, but, you know, I think there's enough blame to go around for everybody. Everybody has a piece of this. Um, you know, the university communicator needs to make sure that they're keeping their researchers honest. The researchers have to be, have to make sure that they're not trying to fool the communicators into putting something out that doesn't have enough substance and the media has to have um, enough knowledge the people who are writing this stuff to ask the right questions and dig a little bit deeper instead of just taking new research news releases lock stock and barrel and sticking them on the web um, you know there's uh, I like to think the more I think about it, it you know competition it really kind of drives a lot of this um, now, I talked about universities compete. Well, what do faculty compete for? Um, they want tenure. They want to be the keynote speaker at the big conference. They want the invited presentations. They want the citations on their papers. There's, there are incentives. The way the structure is set up, there are incentives to, to encourage some of the behavior that we might not want. You know, fortunately, the majority of the people are on the straight and narrow, but um, you know, the, the, the way things are built um, you know, it's, it's ripe for that to happen. You know, the media, no competition in the media, right? Well, I mean, they want <laughs> eyeballs, ad dollars, influence, it's the same thing. Um, and I would even say that with media, being first to market is even more important. Being the first one to break a story, you'll be the one that everybody talks about. Um, so, you know, there's, that's ripe for the same, the same type of abuse. Okay, let's take another question from this side. Hi, uh, David Goldston from NRDC. Um, hopefully this wasn't dealt with before I got here, in which case I have another question. <laughs> but um, uh, when Carrie Funk just mentioned Tuskegee, it actually brought a question to mind, which is how, how much research, if any, is there on how information on Tuskegee and Henrietta Lacks and things like that actually got out to the wider community since, you know, there was a time when sort of nobody knew about that, right? And almost nobody. Um, and is there anything from the way that information circulated that points to ways we should be trying to circulate other kinds of information. I, so, I mean, I have, I know some studies on, for example, Henry Adelax. Um, uh, uh, Hopkins did an interesting study where they were looking at, uh, again, it was a tissue of banks and every, they did focus groups and every single per person mentioned Henrietta Lacks and it completely colored their perception of, of the consent process. And it goes to something that Jim said, I think Was Carrie's that like a, a relatively elite, I mean, it's kind of amazing. Yeah. One book and nobody knew about it and now, you know, it's now, sort of one, and, the one thing people know about, right? So some people. I, I don't, I think it was a general pub public. I, I want to be careful because there was focus groups too, so you have right. to be careful about generalizing, right? right. But, but for sure, uh, there, there was an interesting, I think, keep in mind it was Hopkins too, right? So that might have been right. a sensitized population. Right, but, right. But, um, 
But, uh, but there's, been, there's other, uh, certainly <clears throat> other examples, and it really goes to something Jim said and other people said, you know, the negative stories have much more power than, than the positive stories. And it goes to that I also, Jim, I think you said that, how lack of trust is not the same thing as trust. And I think that's part of that. Um, and so you, you, defi you definitely see that. And, and also around vaccination, there's been interesting research on social media and, and, uh, and vaccination. And negative things seem to get much more traction and, and spread much more quickly uh, in social media. And there's a whole bunch of reasons for that. So uh, I think for me, I'm taking from you, says these negative stories really, really have an impact. So it's the cliche, trust is easily lost, hard to gain. Right. I'm just wondering if there's a, anything about the patterns in the way they spread that we're kind of missing when we're trying to do the, what well, we view the more positive. So stories. there is there is stuff on Twitter on the patterns right. for sure on uh, how this how the negative stuff uh, right. spreads. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Over here. Uh, so, as most people know, every system delivers exactly what it was designed to do, even <laughs> if the consequences are unintended, and uh, that has an effect has had an effect in two components that may have an effect on public trust. One is the scientific community, and the, and the other is the world of journalism, and as you've been talked about, but this is, these are different aspects. Um, there's a classic uh, thought piece in science years ago called Chaos in the Brickyard, which is very cogent for what we're talking about today. There was a time when the goal and the system was designed to build the strongest edifice of knowledge possible, but through a series of hundreds of thousands of highly rational decisions that we've arrived at an irrational consequence. Um, and one of them is that the incentives now are no longer to build the edifice, but to um, produce bricks. Um, and that sometimes leads to chaos in the brickyard if all the incentives are focused on how many bricks you've turned out. Um, and, and I speak from some experience, having served on the NIH Tenure uh, Committee for Epidemiology and Biometry, so you can see where the discussion flows. And so the training is aimed, at, in the scientific community, is aimed at producing bricks. Um, now on the other side is, is the, are the honest brokers, the communicators of the science to the public and the final common pathway, and uh, their training plays a role in this too. I think that they, um, with a, a, an atrophy of the training and, and people devoted to scientific reporting and medical reporting, um, they have gravitated toward reporting on BRICS and uh, they may not have the same training in recognizing um, how the BRICS fit and, and how strong the edifice is. And until we get at those issues of, of the systematic problems, it's a little bit like Pogo, um, I've met the enemy and we are it. Um, we, I think we're gonna be working around the edges and I'd love to hear what uh, your comments are about um, the training that uh, has gotten us to where we are now. Thank you. <clears throat> I'll touch on that. Um, so, so I have an opportunity to talk to a lot of, a lot of men and women on faculty at Georgia Tech. And, and what I find when I talk to them about public outreach, about communication, um, there's a huge desire to do it. They want to get out there, want to speak, want to be part of the conversation. Um, they, and this is in, at, at many universities um, that I've talked to people from, they don't feel that they get um, the proper support. You know, they're not trained to do it the right way. Um, you know, it's not part of the scientific training. Um, and they also tell me that you know, it's not, not so much just the training, it's the fact that they don't feel that their universities value it. Mm -hmm. um, and that all comes from you know, how you move up the food chain uh, within a university. You know, what are the things that are valued? Um, you know, it's, it, it, it's not every university, and I, I, don't, I don't know, maybe you know of a university where um, this public outreach, this public exposure, this getting out there, maybe contributing to STEM education, doing some of the things that are above and beyond uh, to help engage the community. Um, I, I don't know that there are a lot of universities that are uh, making that part of the tenure process. Um, so I think that's kind of where you were going with this, that you know, what we value really drives you know, the activity at the end of the day. You know, and um, 
it's, it, it, you're right, it's going to take a long time for us, and, and we're going to have to be very creative on how we figure out how to deal with it. So can I add to that a little Go bit? Um, I talked about we, the need for a new social contract between the scientific community and, and the public, and wasn't sure yet how science would respond to that. I think scientists need to start viewing patients, if it's healthcare research, or the public, if it's some other research, as partners. And that's the kind of word where people tend to think, oh yeah, I do, I do, I do. But really, they don't. And I see this in, um, I made reference to PCORI, Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute. One of the conditions of getting the money from them for the initiative we're doing in multiple sclerosis is that the data gathering, healthcare data gathering, from what we hope will be 20,000 MS patients needs to be entirely governed by patients. Hmm. And moreover, the research requests that come to us that will over time come to use the healthcare data from these 20,000 MS patients need to every proposed research proposal gets reviewed by a research committee comprised not only of research experts, wait for it, but patients. Honest to God, people living with MS. Hmm. And if they, they can feed back and say, we don't think we like your research protocol. You forgot X, Y, and Z. And this is a very interesting model, because after all, it's our data you're using. So if we can develop a lexicon, I think, around that partnership, I think everybody would be better off. And all the stakeholders would come to the table as I think Jim referred to, do you, do you feel you're participating in the system? Do you have some control and input on the system? I think it's a good trend if we can generalize from what we're doing in these patient-powered research networks. Thank you. And Jim? Well, mm -hmm. I, I like your comments a lot about when I retired 10 years ago, I wrote an article called Furnishing the Edifice. And so your mention of the edifice, it was an, speaking as a researcher rather than a communicator at this point, it was an attempt to say, here's the theoretical framework that I've put together for the practice of public relations. Now, here's all the things within the edifice that we don't know yet. So putting the furniture into the edifice. Um, your comment about the bricks and, uh, reminds me of the phrase salami science. Maybe you've heard that one also. The idea that the pressure on scientists is, to is just to cut off small pieces of their research and, and publish those because of the pressure to accumulate a lot of publications. And I think as I listen to a lot of, of these examples that Tim gave of, you know, all of the news about how this has changed and this has changed and this has changed, I think a lot of those are just bricks or pieces of salami that get reported as though they are part of some larger theory when often they're just in individual findings. So in the part of science communicators, we have to be able to train science writers, uh, public relations science writers and others to report theory and not just research results. And I think, again, the emphasis of, of overall theory is extremely important because uh, the best science writers are the ones who can look at a whole package of research and say, here is how this fits into this and why we know this and not that and not just get a story, a press release comes out, I can get a story, I report it, and I move on to something else. I, in my lifetime, I've been interviewed by a number of, of reporters in different countries when I've gone to speak, and almost always the reporters know nothing at all about what they came to interview me about. And so I could give them almost anything, and it reported exactly as I said it, and I think that <laughs> happens all the time. Um, so. Journalists and, and science communicators really have to you have a deeper understanding of theory when they're reporting scientific research. <clears throat> and concurrently, scientists need to think in terms of programs of research rather than bricks, as you put it. Thank you. Another question? Hi, I'm Nancy Huddleston from the National Research Council. Jim sort of just preempted my question. I don't think it's as much the integrity of PR people that we worry about, but the fact that these stories come out one, one story at a time, one finding at a time, with no contextualization, 
And I've done most of my work here in climate change, and I feel like, of course, I'm obviously too close to it now, but I feel like we've made headway because there's these big assessments. So say when Jennifer Francis comes out and says, hey, there's a polar vortex that's getting a pattern over the United States, the, the community is quick to say, okay, we're, it's a very interesting theory, we're looking at it, you know, and again, I think I'm too close to it. But <laughs> so, you know, why aren't there assessments, big assessments that people are aware of? How much uh, work do we, you know, do you think, how much help would it be if we spent all of our time to contextualize things in the broader picture? Because scientists do it all the time. They contextualize amongst each other and then they wonder why the public doesn't get it. And you're like, because nobody gave them the memo. So I just wonder what you have to say about that. Anyone? <clears throat> well, I, I love the idea. So you're talking about like um, climate assessments are huge, yeah, like IPCC I mean, or you know. I, I mean, they're, they're great idea, and it go it goes to the broader thing. And one of the things I ended with my talk is this idea of having independent, a, a source of independent information that people that people trust that puts things in in context, right? And I, you know, I really think that that's that is missing. Uh, for, for a lot of areas, you know, Cochrane Collaboration is trying to do it, but you know, it's not a great communication tool, you know, for, for the public. I often tell the public to go there to look at things, and, there's, and it's not ideal. There are a lot of uh, emerging websites, but the, the pr pr problem is that, you know, because there have been assessments on things like vaccination, and yeah. there has been assessment, but the public somehow doesn't either, they don't know about it or they don't trust it, right? So it, if you're going to have that assessment, it has to, to have all the dimensions of the things that we're talking about today, I think, in order to have resonance with the, the public more broadly. And I'm curious, uh, Carrie, it, has the tide changed on climate change? I don't know, that was that a pun? <laughs> it might have been a pun. <laughs> uh, I mean, I still see the broad pattern, which is that there is a lot of politically, politically rooted divide over kind of anything having to do with what's happening and what the policy recommendations are coming out related to climate. Yeah, I'm too close to it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yes, um, my, my, my name's Marcos Huerta. I work uh, in the Office of Science with a colleague of Rick. Um, I realize there's a media panel this afternoon, uh, so this question might be out of scope, but I'm not going to be here in the afternoon, so I'll just ask it now. <laughs> um, how, how much of our woes really comes back to the, to the, to the media and the, and the press? Because you know, I, I feel like there's sort of two fundamental problems that keeps happening. We get sort of these he said, she said articles where, where you lead with with where you give both sides equal weight. And there was an NPR story two weeks ago about homeopathy, and they led with a homeopathic practitioner uh, and, and, a, and, a, and a patient who felt like she'd been helped. And, and that was the lead. And, and then they brought in the, the, the FDA and the scientists. Um, and then, but then you get articles in the Times, which the public editor had to respond to, the New York Times, like three or four weeks ago, uh, where it was about the dangers of, uh, of, of, magna, of uh, radio wave. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and there was no. Uh, skepticism. It was just sort of a piece like saying that, you know, maybe your, your phone is, is going to cause you cancer or what have you. And then to the point that the, the public editor weighed in. So how much of, of the issue with sort of trust in science, it really comes back to sort of this very muddled um, and challenging media uh, landscape where we have sort of these two, these two kinds. We, sometimes we get stories that are just, that don't have enough balance and sometimes we get stories that have sort of this false balance. Tim? Well, I certainly have a view on this. <laughs> um, so uh, it, the media is everything and not everything. <laughs> so so uh, I agree with, with Kirk. It, you know, a lot of people pick on press releases in the media. In fact, some of our own research has found that um, it's, it is not the media's fault. And, so, and we did one of the earliest studies that we did was on, on genetics. And we actually found that the media was pretty good at representing what they were given. Right, so there, the, there were uh, errors of omission because they can't put everything in there. They can't put the conflicts and, st and stuff. But, but what was quoted was either a quote from the, the press release or from the scientist, right? And that's where the hype was. And our most recent study, the one on stem cells, we found the same thing. So, so the errors, you know, the, is a lack of context and it's what, what's missing uh, in, from the story. But it's not all, you know, it's not all the media's fault. As Kirk said, it's, it, it's this very complex system that's creating uh, these representations. It's not the media's fault. It's not, it's not even the institution's fault. It's this, this long kind of systemic phenomenon, uh, which, one of the which makes it so difficult to deal with. And then layer on top of that, social media, as someone has already pointed, uh, pointed out, right, that, that you know, takes over a particular message for whatever reason, and it starts trending. And then that, has, that creates uh, a, a, another layer of complexity to it. So, 
Absolutely, the media. When I said the media is everything, because you're right, and that's what you're, you're pointing to, that's how the public sees it, right? But now the public is also controlling, I hate this term, but I'm going to use it, <laughs> curating the story themselves, right? They're curating what becomes big, what trends. So it's a fascinating uh, interaction and a systemic phenomenon. Well, I think there's an, ap an upside to social media, and that, like when that, when that, uh, New York Times article on the electromagnetic radiation being problematic Absolutely. came out. There was a huge uh, response, you know, yeah. on, on, on Twitter and other places pushing back that I think ultimately got the public editor to yeah. to respond. Absolutely, and, you know, Ivan's work. You know, he's done stuff where it, it, I, you know, he's had an impact on how things, how science is represented, right, uh, through social media. Uh, there was a homeopathy story in Canada that was completely driven by social media. So, you know, it is a good news, bad news story. But for our purposes, I think what it is is it's a complexity story. It's and that's this really challenging dimension. Go ahead, Kirk. Uh, just briefly on that, the, you know, the complexity piece, um, if we look at how media has segmented itself, you know, where there's a different news outlet essentially for every ideology right now, uh, you know, and I have this divide even in my own family, thankfully not in my own house, but within my family there are certain people that I have trouble talking to about anything dealing with the environment or climate because there's one particular network that is always on the TV in that house. And they're <laughs> forbidden from putting it on when they come to my house. But the, you know, if you think about it, that I'm doing the same thing. You know, if you look at my Facebook feed or you look at the channels that I watch on television, uh, where I get my news, you know, those are the outlets that I'm most comfortable with. Those are the ones that give me information that I trust. Um, so, you know, there, there's that divide too, which is a big piece of it. Great, thank you. Rick? So I'm Rick Borschelt from the Department of Energy's Office of Science. And while I'm no longer one of Jim Grunig's graduate students, and therefore <laughs> I don't have to kiss up to the professor, I will say that uh, one of the big themes coming across in social media and the Twitter account now and online has to do with this fundamental distinction between measuring trust and measuring distrust. And I want to ask the panelists to unpack this a little bit for us. And maybe if I could ask Carrie to talk about how do you measure those differently? And are the surveys we're looking at really conflating those two things? And then ask Jim from his perspective about activist publics, what are your strategies and tactics that are different for, for cultivating trust versus addressing distrust, and how do you see them differently in a public relations perspective? And then the other panelists obviously have uh, good thoughts to add to those as well. Thanks. Who wants to go first? Carrie? Um, I'll let, uh, this way I can let Jim have the last word. Um, I think it's interesting. It, it's a common idea that there are, that these concepts like trust and all sorts of other um, kind of big mental model concepts are multi-dimensional. Um, the other alternative is to just think of it in terms of the asymmetrical impact of positive and negative, and maybe it's all one piece of the same dimension. So that's, that's what I think of in terms of the, um, really the scholarly side of, are there different components that are going on, or is it a different impact of negative information? And I, I don't really know the answer. Um, I, I actually I tried to look at some measures to, to look at distrust and active distrust, and there is a, but there's a difficulty of the measures, and I couldn't find any decent ones, so I didn't bring them. Um, but I think that part of what uh, what I see today is to understand how really how limited our measurement of trust in science has been, and we um, I think there's so much more area that we could explore and to get a better handle on this, and that's where I hope. Um, we can go in the future. Well, Rick, I can't, I can't act like an expert because I haven't been doing research for several years, but much of my information comes from articles that I'm asked to review for, for various journals and, and two or three articles for mass communication and public relations journals recently have made this distinction between trust and distrust. And I thought, aha, that's really an interesting idea. And there are some, there was an article just appeared in the last issue of the Journal of Public Relations Research uh, written by two of my former students, uh, uh, Sung Un Yang and Min Jung Kang and someone else. 
uh, in which they picked up measures of trust and distrust. And there's another article that I read for Journalism Mass Communication Quarterly that I haven't seen published yet, and I don't know who wrote it, but they had the, the, the same sort of thing. Um, and I think that the, the interesting thing about distrust is it's created more by bad behavior than lack of trust. And one thing I've emphasized over and over again as I teach public relations, as I think you know, is that, we're, uh, that actions speak louder than words. And so it's the behaviors of organizations that really matter to people more than uh, the, what they're saying, you know, what they're promoting or, or the messages that they're putting out. So uh, just an example, I think I uh, recently read, I mentioned the article about swine flu, swine flu vaccinations in Finland. And there was a much discussion, I think it was about two years ago or something, about whether everyone should get uh, vaccinated with sw for swine flu. And much of the discussion was, of, was expressing distrust in corporations, particularly pharmaceutical companies, producing vaccines. That the major purpose for promoting swine flu vaccinations was to sell more products. And this is particularly true among liberals, I think. Liberals distrust corporations, typically. And so they're, when we talk about different kinds of media and so on, they're more likely to, to uh, be moved, you know, to express distrust uh, when it's produced by a corporation. Now, the other sign, the unknown network and so on, uh, distrust government. So anytime the government tries to mandate that you be vaccinated for something, that particular group with conservative ideology is going to be opposed to it. So I'm not sure there is a way when publics are ideologically driven, you're not going to change their minds through facts or anything of that sort. And I'm not sure there's any way uh, to change that. Although, uh, again, in the, the swine flu example, simply engaging and not just letting the extreme dominate the discussion to get into the discussion right away and point out not just the advantages but to deal with the emotional sorts of things in dealing with the the uh, uh, accusations and so on that might be made um, I guess another example I think of right now are, are Bill and Hillary Clinton and the, all of the negative information coming out about the Clinton Foundation uh, Bill seems to be engaging. I'm not sure if Hillary is, but I think this sort of thing where they really need to come out and explain what they are doing and not just deny rumors and that sort of thing. So when you get into this uh, hot issue public kind of area where the media are jumping on something and different ideologies are taking different points of view and that sort of thing, the most important thing is to enter the discussion not sit back and let the extreme groups dominate uh, because otherwise people, <laughs> low involvement publics pay attention at this point and they tend to remember all the negative stuff even though it doesn't particularly affect them and it, they, it doesn't affect their behavior too much but they pass it on, they pass it on in Twitter and they discuss it with their friends and it has curiosity value and it, you know, it's wonderful. It's if you're uh, some ideologies to know that there's this vast government conspiracy or corporate conspiracy, so it just keeps going and going. But for the active publics, it's a matter of understanding the problems that they're facing in their lives and genuinely answering their questions. So if, if I need to know whether to get uh, treatment for prostate cancer, for example, which is in my latest stage of my life, that's an important question. You know, should you, um, you know, should you be treated for prostate cancer? Should you have biopsies and so on? People have all kinds of questions, and whether it's NIH or doctors or something or websites, they need to address those questions and answer those questions. So have communicators and specialists who are actually engaged in answering people's real questions because if it's a problem that that you feel an involvement with that affects your life in some way you're going to actively seek information and ideology becomes less important than it does when it's a low involvement issue that you just want to make a political point about. I don't know if that's coherent but it's a sort of off the cuff. 
Thank you. Let me just Karen? pick up on one theme because we keep talking about uh, politics and political ideology, and we do live in a politicized world. The political, uh, kind of the growing political polarization among the public has been a key trend over the past decades. Um, but I, I was talking, I think, earlier this week or last week uh, with another group and, and previewing other analysis that we're doing with our most recent survey of the general public. And we, we actually said it um, earlier as well, that there is not one explanatory factor underlying this set of public attitudes about these science topics. Um, and uh, so there are, there are these issue areas that are highly, uh, strongly related to political and ideological differences in the public. They tend to be familiar ones to you. Climate change is highly polarized in that way. Energy issues tend to be highly divided by political and ideological lines. Um, there are other topics that we surveyed, you know, we didn't even survey the whole of the realm of what you could think of as science, which is a huge set of uh, kind of uh, fuzzy boundaries. Um, but there are other topics even within that survey where we see pretty a pretty modest uh, role of politics and ideology. One example was uh, the question that we asked about whether or not childhood vaccines should be required or left up to parents to decide. And we see other areas where there's essentially no relationship to politics and ideology. Judgments like whether or not GM foods are safe to eat are essentially not related. So, um, so I think it's important to keep in mind how much is going on in terms of political and ideological differences and when that could come into play in terms of broader policy discussion. Um, but it's also important to realize there's lots of different bases for public attitudes. Okay, Jim. I'll be really brief, and you know, it builds on what Carrie was saying, and you know, why I brought up the self-expression thing. You know, because the general science, this general literature says that people do have a trust in science broadly, isn't that fair to say, Carrie? And then it breaks down on, the, on these topics. So uh, there's an interesting sort of chicken and egg phenomenon, to which degree is the trust story uh, constructed um, in order to, uh, to, to confirm or be consistent with the pre-existing uh, pre uh, view, whether you're talking about GMOs, whether you're talking about climate change. In other words, do, do people subconsciously create a trust rationale to justify uh, a, a preconceived uh, view? And, and I think there's some literature to, to support that that certainly happens in, on some topics. Great, thank you. Thanks, uh, I'm Tim Beardsley with the American Institute of Biological Sciences. Uh, I'd like to ask Kirk and Tim, to expand on interesting things you said. Uh, Kirk, so how are we then to measure impact? And in fact, what does that mean if we're talking about the public? I, I edit a journal and we pay a lot of attention to usage numbers, how many articles are read. We also pay a lot of attention to citation uh, because that means that scientists are taking articles seriously if they cite them, presumably. Um, but um, citation obviously is not relevant or applicable to the general public. That's when you're talking about scientists to scientists communication. So you, you, you mentioned getting to the right audiences and uh, uh, when a $3 million gift arrives, but that doesn't happen that often, <laughs> I take it. So how are we to measure that impact? And my question for Tim is, which you just started to talk about a bit more, was this self-expression idea. If, if we are to take that seriously, and I think you are looking at something in, interesting there. Uh, what are the implications of that for scientists and for communicators? If, if people do defend in some vague emotional sense an identity and decide who to trust on the basis of almost subconscious attributions of trust, what, if, if there is something to that, what we do to work with it, to use that information? I don't know if you okay. can say anything more about that. Thank you. Kirk? Okay. Impact. Wow. Measuring impact is really hard. Um, <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a couple of different, uh, I mean, we're talking about two different things when we talk about impact of research and impact of communication. Um, so what I'll talk about is the impact of communication, because that's what I'm involved in. Um, and let's just say reputation. How do you know when something that you're doing or your collective activities are having some sort of influence on the reputation of your organization or reputation of your researchers? Um, we use market research or audience research, and there's a, there's a combination of, um, 
I mean, th there's a coming together of communications and marketing that's happening, I think, everywhere, but it's definitely happening in higher ed, um, where we're looking at these audiences and trying to learn as much as we possibly can about them. Um, so we know how they want to be communicated with, and we know uh, how to get to them, what messages we should be sending to get the action that we would love you know, for them to engage in. And um, it's not manipulation, but it's understanding them so that they have the information that they need to make decisions. Um, hopefully it's the decision we would love them to make, but you know, that's often done through market research. We, um, in putting together our communication, our strategic communication and marketing plan for research at Georgia Tech, we went through three phases of market research. The first one was we talked to our own people, um, made sure that they understood what the research strategy of the university was. Um, and we found that there were some disconnects where we even had to find ways to better communicate with our own people um, what we were trying to do. Um, the next phase was going out and because industry is this new audience that we wanted to try to get more involved in research. We went out and we talked to industry. We started with our first phase of industry research, um, speaking to companies that have a relationship with the university already. Why are you here? What do you like? What do you not like? What, what's important um, in a university industry relationship? What do you value? Um, what value do we provide? Um, what can we do better? Um, the final phase was the hardest phase of the research and it took the longest to do, but going out and talking to companies that do little or no work. Um, and I'm not just talking about research, I'm talking about philanthropic or engaging with students. There were a whole bunch of factors that we tested. But these are companies that didn't have a whole lot of engagement with us. Um, getting them to tell us, first of all, why they would engage with the university or not. And we found that there are some sectors that have no interest in engaging with universities, um, other than maybe to connect with the students. Um, you know, the, the tech sector, and I, I use that broadly, but like the Googles of the world don't have a whole lot of interest in doing um, scientific contract research with universities, but they really have an interest in accessing students, which is the future talent pool. So, so as we identify a lot of these um, you know, needs and pain points and things that are important to the audience, we can also test um, how uh, the university ranks in their mind as far as the reputation and we test it against competing universities when we ask the questions. Um, and what we're going to do is in a few years we're going to repeat the study and we're going to see if we've moved the needle. So this is not something like I said before where you can flip on a dashboard and you can get the information you need. It takes months if not a year or more to do that initial research and then you've got to actually do the work and you've got to do it well and then you've got to test again and it's another investment of time and money to do it, but it's really the only way that I know of to see if the needle has moved at all. Uh, so I think that one of the things we need to do is, is uh, Marsha I think touched on this, is recognize that how the importance of peers, the importance of community, uh, and when you engage a scientific to topic, to try as much as possible to work with those communities. And, and because you have social media, you can do that now, right? You can try to engage those communities when you're talking about it. And the idea is if you can have that community start a as a group to, to change your thinking on a topic, it might be, hel might be helpful. And that's, that's incredibly challenging. The other thing, of course, is to work more with popular culture um, because they help to set that kind of self-expression uh, agenda. And I actually think that's a role that celebrities play a big part in. Um, uh, the other interesting thing that I've been speculating about a little bit on this is is, is to talk about the elements of the story that is most important to the form of self-expression. So, for example, with organic food, even though if you believe the studies, most people eat organic food because they think it's best for them, but they'll say they're doing it because, and this is the self-expression part, because it's good for the environment, et cetera, right? So if, if you, if you, um, if, if your communication deals with the, the part of the story that's most relevant to self-expression, perhaps that might have uh, an impact on changing uh, people's minds or at least having them revisit. I mean, we have to be careful about what our, grand, what our goals can be. And then the final thing, and, and again, this is <coughs> speculation, is uh, to concentrate more on the scientific method as, as opposed to trying to con cram the knowledge down and draw people into coming to the conclusion themselves. And again, there's some tentative evidence around uh, uh, in some areas around that. In other words, you know, ex let, if you educate people about the scientific method and, and allow them to come to the logical conclusion, it's going to be a more powerful uh, education 
um, tool as opposed to just trying to say, here's what the facts say. Thank you, Tim. Could I put in a, a quick plug? Um, I was uh, wanted to reflect on what Kirk has said. I think he's given a very good example of, of how to do research in public relations. Uh, as a founding member of the Public Relations Measurement Commission, uh, they've been working for probably 15 years now to come up with measures of the effectiveness of public relations. Um, and also, probably 10 years ago, Rick Borschelt held a conference of the Department of Energy uh, to, in which my wife and I produced a document on guidelines for measuring the effects of, of public relations and so on. But I think very quickly, Kirk has outlined first the importance of formative research, which we don't often think about, to identify who the publics are who are interested in having a relationship with our organization, what their problems are that they would like to have the organization help them to solve. And then after we have programs to communicate with these publics, there are both short-term and long-term effects. Short-term effects can be measured by simple things as exposure, whether people hear the message by awareness of the message, by changes in cognitions, by changes in attitudes, by changes in behavior. But then what's most important, and all of these are things that you have to do research beyond media monitoring to do. Basically, in my mind, media monitoring has very little value except to see whether the messages got out there at all. But then the long-term effects are most effective, um, effectively measured through relationships. And again, I've uh, developed uh, measures of the different characteristics of relationships to see with a particular public whether over time your communication of programs have improved those relationships with uh, people who might want contact with students and all of the examples that Kirk has given. Reputation can also be measured, but I'm not an enthusiastic supporter of, of reputation. I think reputation is essentially a byproduct of relationships. So that if you, we found that if you have a good relationship with a public, they will say good things and think good things about you. But if you emphasize relationships, excuse me, uh, reputation too much, the emphasis goes toward putting out publicity and viewing the idea that publicity creates rep uh, reputation when it really doesn't. The reputation is created through the cultivation of relationships with publics that genuinely want and need a relationship with your organization. Okay, thank you, Jim. I think we have time for one more question. Ida Chow, Society for Developmental Biology. Since the negative reporting, all the negative ideas seem to prevail more in the public's mind than the positive ideas, is there any way for us to use that property and twist it to our favor? Interesting question. Jim? No, your, your mic's low. Is, is there a way to twist the negative information into positive information? You'd utilize that pathway since negative information gets picked up so quickly. But it really all depends on which public you're communicating <laughs> with. Um, for publics, say, that are ideologically opposed to the idea that there's global warming, the more you try to convince them otherwise, the more firmly they're going to believe it and so on, and you find this. So in those cases, communicating more actively to them is just going to make them more aware of self-expression, I guess, is the way, way you put it. Um, so if, you know, if there is negative information going out and people who have some need for that information really do then have questions. Should I vaccinate my children? Should I have a PSA test? Should I get swine flu vaccination and so on? Then the, I think the approach is to find out. You may have to ask them first, but you can also simply monitor the digital media. I think we need to do a lot of monitoring of seeing what questions people are asking that might be stirred up by that negative information and then genuinely answering those questions rather than just trying to hmm. counteract the negative information. But typically, spread, the spread of negative information is correlated with the genuine need for information by some people, and for others, it's just curiosity or a means of self-expression, so yeah. to speak. Carrie? 
I just want to pick up on one thing that Jim said a minute ago, which is the idea that reputation is uh, something that's really more of a byproduct of relationships. And that's something that I've been toying around with for trust as well, and I think others have in the past, that trust uh, is maybe what we're focused on today, but it may be more of the byproduct of a series of complicated interactions that we have over time. That's why it's so complex and it takes so many interactions. But in order to try to fix trust, um, that you might not try to fix it directly, but that's why we're talking about all the different myriad of ways that we're trying to change this environment that's creating the expectation um, for relationships. Marsha. Um, uh, trust, uh, oh, trust is a component of relationships, but I think we create trust through responsible behavior. Uh, primarily, and by then, when there are examples of irresponsible behavior or what are called externalities, then addressing those. You know, if there is a problem with a vaccine, or if there is a problem with, with, uh, oh, I think of Brookhaven Laboratory and dumping radioactive tritium into the groundwater, then you deal with that, and so on. So. It's through behavior and engaging publics that you do create a relationship that supposes trust. Okay. Marsha? Uh, just to build on Jim's engagement idea, one of the things you said was you have to get into the dialogue early. Don't hang around and wait. I'd, I'd build on that to say you have to, in many cases, initiate the discussion initiate. and not wait until you're reactive. And sometimes you can position uh, an idea in term, in ways that will be more acceptable. So, for example, I think a lot of people care about polar bears um, and their survival, but they may not like the idea of debating climate change. So maybe the discussion can be around how to save polar bears. Okay. Very um, quickly, Kirk. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say, you know, and this ties into all of this, mistakes aren't the end of the world, as long as you address them right away. Um, saying you're sorry is pretty powerful. And you know you can look back to the whole cold fusion thing when it first happened. Um, Georgia Tech was one of the first universities to come out and say, yes, this is real, when we were also one of the first universities to say, oh my gosh, we messed up. We didn't replicate this experiment. Um, it didn't hurt, although there were people who thought that it was going to be the end of the world to come out um, and admit wrong, you know, that we were wrong. Um, it, it can have the opposite effect. So don't be afraid to fess up if you mess up. That's really important, and do it quickly. Thank you, Kirk. I'd like to um, thank all of our panelists, but I'd also like to ask them to answer one question that I have left, my moderator's, moderator's privilege, with the recognition that, one, it's 12 o'clock and it's time for lunch. So I'd like you to do this in one sentence, and that is if you could suggest something that we could take for our next step, what would it be in one sentence? Tim. Uh, okay, uh, I'll go with the incentives thing. Incentives. Uh, that we need to uh, revisit the incentives that we have created for the production uh, and dissemination of scientific research. Thank you, Kurt. He took mine. <laughs> you did. You could say you, you could say did. ditto. Lucky. Um, I, I'll just repeat what I said. You know, if you mess up, make sure you fess up and do it quickly. It's not the end of the world. Good. I would say something about the important thing is to learn how to engage in what I call two-way symmetrical communication with active publics. Uh, I think in the broad terms, we should be thinking about the complexity of these systems. We're really talking about a new model when uh, I think really some of Marsha's comments underscored that, that it's going to change, we have to change our way of thinking about engagement to go forward. Marsha? I get to build on what everybody else said. Um, I would ask this uh, august body to convene a different kind of workshop in which we brought together representatives of the major scientific disciplines with representatives of major commun national community organizations of consumers and or patients to define a new social contract by which we will engage with each other moving forward. Thank you very much, and thank you to all our speakers and panelists.